my fellow weirdlings, it's Margot, and this month I'm bringing you 31 Days of Halloween, kicking off with these real-life Halloween horror stories. If you're ready to get spooked and spine-tingled, keep watching. Warning. Contains sensitive subject matter and potentially disturbing images. In 1974, eight-year-old Timothy O'Brien from Deer Park, Texas died on Halloween night after eating cyanide-laced pixie sticks candy. It turned out the candy was poisoned by Timmy's optician father, Ronald, who was $100,000 in debt and had taken out $60,000 worth of life insurance policies on his children. In addition to Timmy, Ronald O'Brien had given poison candy to his five-year-old daughter, Elizabeth, and three neighbor children in an attempt to cover up his crime. Thankfully, none of them ate it, though police found one of the poisoned pixie sticks clutched in the hand of one of the sleeping children. O'Brien, nicknamed the Candyman and the Man Who Killed Halloween, who even lacked the shame to think better of offering the prosecutor at his trial a Tootsie Roll, was executed by lethal injection in March 1984 after 10 years in prison for capital murder. This is the only deliberate Halloween poisoning fatality ever documented, though the incident has spawned public fear and urban legends for decades, and many involved in the O'Brien case still can't bear to celebrate the holiday to this day. In 1945, an enormous and raucous street party filled a section of Queen Street East in the beaches in Toronto. Being the first Halloween since the end of World War II, it drew a crowd of an estimated 7,000 rowdy teenagers. Huge bonfires were started in the middle of the road blocking streetcars. Backyard fences were torn down and used to feed the blaze. Flames were sweeping down the streetcar tracks as gasoline was poured over them. Obstacles were placed to block fire trucks from accessing the site. When police on horseback began beating the crowd with clubs and arrested some of the partygoers, the angered crowd decided to go to the police station to free them, hurling rocks at windows and turning on fire hydrants along the way. As the crowd approached the police station, police and firemen turned fire hoses on them. Prevented from reaching the station, the teenagers retaliated by showering the police and firemen with debris. A police captain said, I never saw so many rocks and pieces of concrete fly through the air at one time. Police then resumed clubbing the crowd and making arrests. Spectators complained they were beaten for no reason. The crowd dispersed and the riot was over. Because the beaches has been promoted in a much more positive light in the decades that have followed, this incident has been largely and seemingly purposely forgotten. In 1963, more than 4,000 Hoosiers decided to spend Halloween night at the Indiana State Fairgrounds Coliseum, now known as the Indiana Farmers Coliseum, watching a holiday on ice skating exhibition. Unbeknownst to the crowd, a rusty tank in the concession area began to leak propane. The unventilated room quickly filled with gas. Just after 11 p.m., as the skaters began gliding into a pinwheel formation for their grand finale, the gas reached an electric popcorn maker, triggering a huge explosion. When the gas ignited, a blast of orange flame shot 40 feet up through the south side seats, catapulting people and chairs through the air. Concrete chunks and body parts rained down. Many of the spectators on the south side of the building fell on the ice, while others fell into a crater caused by the explosion and were buried beneath the rubble. A local reporter attending the show with his wife recounted the following. For a few seconds, no one cried out. Then there were screams and cries of agony, and the audience jumped from their seats as if in unison and started rushing for the exits. The orchestra continued to play. My wife was drawn to a small blonde girl with her mother. The child's blue coat was soaked with blood. They were looking for her father. Outside the main entrance, a man was sitting with a huge black and blue lump by his left eye. Part of the calf of his left leg was gone. Another local reporter in attendance said, You walked into a nightmare. This was the worst thing I've seen since combat in World War II. The lights above still cast the bluish light they cast onto the ice show. A red satin slipper lay on the ice. Three feet away was a pool of blood. A gray-haired man lay on his back, staring lifelessly at the ceiling. Ambulance attendants threw a gray blanket across him. Chairs were scattered like ten pins on the south end of the big building. The fairgrounds itself was almost like a battleground, the surrounding streets thick with police and the edges of streets jammed with crowds like war refugees, slowing the movement of ambulances and fire engines. A nearby cattle barn was used as a makeshift hospital, and the coroner's office set up a temporary morgue on the ice floor. The dead were placed on plywood and lined along the ice according to gender and age. Family members came to identify loved ones. Every hospital in Indianapolis and the surrounding counties took in the wounded, calling for anyone with any medical training to volunteer their assistance. Fifty-four people were pronounced dead at the scene, and another twenty later succumbed to their injuries. Nearly another four hundred people were injured. 
A grand jury indicted the state fire marshal, the Indianapolis fire chief, the general manager and the concessions manager of the Coliseum, as well as officers of the company that supplied the gas, but the only conviction was that of the president of the gas supplier, which was later overturned by the Indiana Supreme Court. Victims and survivors ultimately received about $4.6 million in settlements, a memorial plaque now hangs inside the building's entrance. On Halloween night, 1982, 69-year-old Marvin Brandland and his wife Ethel had spent the evening handing out candy to trick-or-treaters from their home in Fort Dodge, Iowa, and were preparing to go to bed. When they heard a knock at their door, they assumed it was one last trick-or-treater. They opened the door to find someone wearing a pillowcase over their head, with holes cut out for eyes. The figure said, trick or treat, give me your money or I'll shoot. Ethel playfully tried to lift the pillowcase, thinking it must be a relative playing a joke. Their granddaughter had left their house just minutes before. The trick or treater held the pillowcase in place. When Ethel turned and started for the candy, the trick or treater followed her inside, then pulled out a gun. He ordered the couple to the basement, where they kept a safe. When they got to the kitchen, Marvin, refusing to go any further, still figuring this was a prank since only family members knew about the safe, grabbed for the gun. The person in the pillowcase fired the gun, shooting Marvin in the throat. The shooter then tore off the pillowcase and threw it down before fleeing from the couple's home. Marvin Brandland was rushed to the local hospital, then airlifted to a hospital in Des Moines, where he died on the operating table. As the months passed and the killer remained free, the loneliness took its toll on Ethel. Thanksgiving Day, surrounded by family, she broke down. She'd stopped eating and couldn't stop crying. She died a few months later. Her family feels she died of a broken heart. The Brandlands family is certain they know who the shooter is. An acquaintance of the family is said to have bragged about it to them after the killing. Police confirm this individual is the prime suspect, but there just wasn't enough evidence to make an arrest. Though the suspect's name hasn't been released, Ethel Brandlin told the police the shooter had blondish hair and blue eyes, was about 5 foot 8 inches tall, and between 16 and 20 years old. In 2010, the pillowcase left behind by the killer was tested for DNA, but there wasn't enough evidence on it to make a match. The family says they plan to keep pushing for an arrest, even though they're afraid the killer may come after them. On Halloween in 1984, 8-year-old Brian Massey and his sisters, 11-year-old Tiffany and 10-year-old Tamara, should have been enjoying a night of trick-or-treating. Instead, they were fighting for their lives in a real-life Halloween horror. When police arrived at Brian Massey's childhood home in Miami County, Kansas, in the early morning of November 1st, they say there wasn't a wall in the house that didn't have blood on it. They found Brian's mother, 28-year-old Jean Yackel, lying in a pool of blood in the living room, multiple stab wounds clearly visible on her lifeless body. In a bedroom down the hall, crammed into a corner between a bed and the wall, they discovered the bodies of Tiffany and Tamara, also covered in blood and knife wounds. Brian and his new stepfather, 26-year-old David L. Andrews, were nowhere to be found. After two days of searching, Brian was found alive inside Andrews' sister's house in Port Huron, Michigan. Andrews was also there, having survived shooting himself in an attempted suicide. Police learned Andrews had murdered Jean Yackel before chasing her two young daughters down the hall and murdering them as well. Andrews then came into Brian's room, covered in blood, then kidnapped and abused the traumatized boy. Andrews was charged with three counts of first-degree murder, along with kidnapping and sodomy. Despite the abundance of evidence, the prosecution faced some roadblocks when the murder weapon was never found, and they realized Brian would likely have had to testify during a jury trial. Andrews' mental status was also questioned. Investigators were also never able to find any of Andrews' blood at the crime scene, despite him slicing his hand during the attack. Andrews, who had a violent history, including once stabbing his brother in a drunken rage, said he was drinking heavily that night. He said he remembered grabbing a knife and hearing a lot of screaming, but he didn't remember the actual stabbings. Andrews pleaded guilty in exchange for dropping the kidnapping and sodomy charges and reducing the first-degree murder charges to three counts of second-degree murder. In June 1985, he was sentenced to 15 years to life in prison for each second-degree murder conviction, with the sentences to run consecutively for a total sentence of 45 years. Andrews was up for his first parole in 2007, then again in 2017. Brian Massey, along with family members, friends, and classmates of Brian's sisters, and detectives who'd worked the case, have fought hard to keep Andrews behind bars. At Halloween in 1990 in Lakewood, New Jersey, 17-year-old high school junior Brian Jewell's job was to give hayride customers a scare by pretending to hang from a gallows. 
He was supposed to have the noose around his neck, but it was not a noose that tightened. Brian would step down about one foot to the ground, making it appear he had been hanged as the hayride approached. The stunt had worked fine up until this point, but at around 8 p.m. the hayride driver became concerned when Jewel failed to give the speech he normally did as the wagon passed. He checked on Brian and discovered he was dead. The prop noose had actually somehow tightened around his neck. Just six days later in Charlotte, North Carolina, 15-year-old William Anthony Odom was working with friends to construct a haunted house in his aunt's basement for a private Halloween party. William was supposed to hide in a cupboard with a fake noose made of a three-foot length of nylon ski rope around his neck and jump out at people passing through. Instead, William was found dead inside the cupboard. The coroner said the rope apparently tightened around Odom's neck as he crouched in the cupboard and he either passed out or panicked. Similarly, in 2001, 14-year-old Caleb Reeb of Sparta Township, Michigan, was asphyxiated to death by a prop noose at a haunted hayride attraction at a Sparta horse farm. Caleb loved Halloween and running around in the dark, so he'd been thrilled to get a job where he got to scare people. They'd actually already hired all the staff they needed the night he died, but he'd offered to work for free. He'd started the evening working at a post featuring a coffin, then switched with another worker at a station with a skeleton hanging from a noose tied to a small tree. Caleb wanted his station to be scarier, so he switched the skeleton with himself. As he let go of the rope with the noose around his neck, the tree whipped back and pulled the rope taut, choking him as his feet remained on the ground. Tragically, while Caleb scrambled to get the tightening noose off his neck, onlookers assumed he was acting. Hayride employees and participants tried to resuscitate Caleb, but he was pronounced dead at the scene. On October 26, 2005, a 42-year-old Federica Delaware woman committed suicide by hanging herself from a tree across the street from a residential area about a quarter mile from her home. The body, suspended about 15 feet above the ground, was easily visible from passing vehicles for several hours that morning, but everyone dismissed it as a Halloween decoration. Similarly, in mid-October 2009, the decomposing body of a 75-year-old suicide by gunshot victim sat undisturbed on the balcony of the deceased home in Marina del Rey, California for several days because neighbors assumed it was merely part of a Halloween display. The body was in plain view of the entire apartment complex. I honestly thought this one was an urban legend, but 46-year-old Dale Porch of Denver was coming home from working the overnight shift at the Regional Transportation District on November 2, 2012, when he collapsed on the steps of his front porch. Porch's family was horrified to discover Porch's body quite close to the mailbox and to realize their postal worker had delivered the mail, apparently ignoring their family member as he lay dead or dying. The U.S. Postal Service said in a statement that the worker felt terrible about ignoring Porch's body but thought it was part of a Halloween display. The mail carrier was shocked and extremely upset to learn the truth. The Postal Service said the man was conscientious and dedicated and someone who would certainly help a customer if he knew they were in need. They said it was an unfortunate situation that probably wouldn't have happened any other time of the year. On a Tuesday night just before Halloween in 2014, 35-year-old Derek Ward of Farmingdale, New York, decapitated his 66-year-old college professor mother, Patricia, then dragged her body out of their apartment in what neighbors assumed was a Halloween prank. Derek had apparently sat with his mother's mutilated body for a few minutes inside their blood-spattered home before taking it outside and kicking her head 20 feet down the street. Still thinking it was a prank, neighbors even tried to lift up the body. As they were doing so, Derek jumped in front of an oncoming Long Island Railroad train, ending his life. Family members say Derek had been showing signs of mental illness and drug abuse for about 10 years, but was too old to be covered by his mother's insurance. They'd struggled to find a doctor that would accept Medicaid. They said Patricia had finally found a compassionate doctor that was scheduled to see Derek in just two days from when the murder-suicide took place. Derek's behavior had become increasingly erratic in the days leading up to the tragedy, but he'd never shown signs of violence that anyone had observed. He had been complaining about small noises hurting his head and making him angry. Derek was found to be carrying a pistol and 100 Valiums when he died. Patricia had suffered multiple stab wounds and broken ribs before she died. In 1992, 16-year-old Japanese exchange student Yoshihiro Hitori was invited to a Halloween party in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Dressed up as John Travolta's character from Saturday Night Fever, Yoshi had been watching a lot of Travolta's movies leading up to the party. 
He set off to the party with the son of his foreign exchange host family, Webb Haymaker. Upon arriving at the address where they were dropped off, a house with Halloween decorations and three cars in the driveway, they received no response from other partygoers after knocking on the front door a few times. According to Webb, they eventually saw a woman open a side garage door and peer out before slamming it in their faces. We were walking away sort of confused. I had started to walk down the block, wondering if it was a different house, Webb explained. But then someone opened the door. Rodney Pears opened the door. Yoshi turned back toward him. He was very eager to get to the party and didn't understand, I guess, that Pears had a gun. Maybe he thought it was a Halloween thing, Webb said. He was light on his feet and just sang in a very boisterous way, We're here for the party, we're here for the party, sort of happy. Pears shouted freeze, but Yoshi seemed not to understand and kept moving forwards. Pears fired once, hitting Yoshi in the chest and slammed the door. Tragically, they were at the wrong house. The party was actually six houses away. Pears, visibly shaken and crying in the courtroom at his manslaughter trial, was cleared of all charges after only three hours of jury deliberation. Pears testified that Yoshi appeared to him as a grinning, potentially crazed intruder who was brandishing a weapon and refused to stop when Pears yelled freeze. In reality, Yoshi was dressed as John Travolta in Saturday Night Fever and was brandishing nothing more menacing than a camera. It's unclear whether Yoshi understood what Pears meant by the command to freeze. A Japanese correspondent covering the case commented, We Japanese don't understand the Gun Society of America, and we don't understand why this man had so much fear that he would shoot a boy. Pears' wife, Bonnie, testified that she was frightened by Yoshi's appearance and his statement, We're here for the party. That's all I have for you today. I hope you've enjoyed these stories and we'll come back for more. Like, subscribe, leave a comment, and bring your friends, family, COVID pod, cult members, and visible friends or enemies. And if you want me to share your story, I'll leave my contact info in the description box. Thanks so much for watching.